What is the church? The church is the people of God, powered by the Spirit of God, guided by the Word of God, working for the glory of God. This is the church. The church is not just a place. The church is the people. The church is not just a monument. It's a movement. The church is not just a building. It's a body. The church is not just an accessory. It's a necessity. This is the church. The Bible says the church is the hope of the world, the salt of the earth, and the city on a hill. The church is the family of God, the body of Christ, and light in the darkness. The church is God's plan A, and there is no plan B. The church is where all kinds of people from all kinds of places come together to forsake their sins and to worship their Savior. Where chains are broken and broken hearts are put back together, where prodigals come home and captives are set free, this is the church. Where blind eyes are opened and good news is preached, where the low are lifted up and the proud are brought low, where the lost are found and the helpless find help, where brothers and sisters can find love and acceptance from each other and from their Father in heaven, this is the church. Where the disciples of Jesus are built up in their most holy faith. The church is where the gospel is. The church is where grace is. The church is where God is. The church is you. The church is me. The church is all of us. This is the church. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Romans, chapter 9. The book of Romans, chapter 9. And let me just mention very quickly, in your bulletin there's a section there that says, bring your friends. And so, Easter Sunday is going to be a friend Sunday. Now, in the future, we'll look to have uh, multiple you know, friend Sundays, and, and, and throughout the year, we'll look to have different friend Sundays, but... This Easter Sunday is Friend Sunday, and so each of us is encouraged to invite or bring at least one friend to worship services on that Sunday. And I was sharing with the uh, 830 crowd this morning, I know of one church where they actually, they challenged the people of the church to actually take out their smartphones and right there in the service to invite somebody to come for Easter Sunday. Now, I'm not going to put you on the spot like that this morning, but I do want to encourage you and just all of us, you know, let's look for somebody. Let's find somebody. Let's pray uh, about someone. And uh, I had someone who came and told me this morning, and uh, uh, Virginia, I hope you don't mind. I'm just going to say this real quick. <laughs> Virginia came to me this morning, and she said, you know how we're, we're doing the um, Who's Your One? Uh, and, you know, who's your one, who, who's the person that you're praying for uh, to, to be saved, uh, to come to Christ? Virginia told me that her one got saved. Amen. And uh, that's, that's, that's what it's all about, you know. That's what it's all about is that we think about that person, whoever it is, and we start praying for them, and uh, we watch them come into the kingdom. And so that's exciting. And so uh, just be thinking, God, who is it that you would have me to invite? to come to Easter Sunday and then get on the phone, you know, get, get um, whether you're calling them, texting them, you know, whatever, and, and hey, man, love to have you come and to be with me or be with, you know, me and my family. And, uh, it, you know, that's, that's how it happens. You know, there's a lot of things that we can do in the community. We can put up billboards, you know, we can put things in the paper. You know, there's so much that you can do. But can I tell you something? They have never, they have never, as of yet, they have never found a way to see the church grow faster than by word of mouth. 
than by the people of God going out into the community and saying, man, you got to come and check out what God is doing at our church. And so just want to encourage you to do that. And so you have your Bibles there, Romans chapter 9. Let's go Lord in prayer as we begin today. Father, thank you for your goodness to us, and we thank you for the opportunity, God, to be able to be here on this beautiful, beautiful day. And uh, Father, we just thank you for how we've already been blessed. God, I thank you for forgiving and just that wonderful message and song. Uh, that was just powerful, God, and just pray that that would carry us uh, into this week. And, and Father, we come to the time now in the service where we open your word. And Father, this is, this is a time of worship as well. The way that we listen and the way that we are willing to accept and willing to make the changes that need to be made in our lives, Lord, this is all an act of worship, just as much as if we were singing or if we were giving or, or anything else that we do. Lord, the way that we listen to your word and then perform it, God, it is an act of worship. And so, God, we pray that you would bless our time, help us to listen intently, and then, God, help us to make spiritual decisions. Holy Spirit of God, have your will and way in the service today, move in and out of these pews, touch and, heart, uh, touch and change hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in November of 1859, Charles Darwin rocked the world with his book, The Origin of Species. And in this book, Darwin spoke of a natural selection that takes place as one species becomes extinct and another evolves to take its place. In Darwin's estimation, this selection is not based upon God or some intelligent design, but rather on survival of the fittest. And of course, we understand as believers in Jesus Christ that this flies in the face of the Word of God. And I think about Romans 1, verses 20 through 22, which says, for since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. So what the Bible is saying is, unless you were taught that, you know, everything evolved, unless you were taught that by somebody, then most people, if, you're, if you were driving down the road and you are uh, observing the beauty of God's creation, you're seeing the trees and the flowers and the sky and and everything that, that God has created, that if, if somebody hasn't taught you that things evolve, then the natural person would look at that and they would say, there's got to be something behind that. There's got to be some kind of a God or, or something behind that. There's no way in the world that this came into being all by itself. It says here, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know what that means? That means that one day we're all going to stand before the Lord. Some will stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and some will stand at the great white throne judgment. And if you stand at the great white throne judgment, uh, that is a sad place to be because that is a judgment for those who have not received Christ and will not receive Christ. God says that no one will be able to stand before him. Having lived in this life, having been able to look around and see his creation, nobody will be able to stand before God and say that I have an excuse. I have an excuse for why I didn't believe. He says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, Professing to be wise, they became fools. And that's where we are in our country today. You know, we profess to be wise, you know, in our culture, but we have a culture that is filled with foolish people because the Bible teaches that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of instruction. Amen? You know, you start, you start with the fear of the Lord. And then you build on that foundation. And unfortunately, we have not done that in our culture. You know, and we look, at, we look at the culture today and we see children and teenagers that are running around killing people. And we say, how in the world did it ever get to this? 
Well, the reason it got to this is because we have raised a generation of children that were taught that their life is an accident. That there's no God, and if there's no God, then there is no plan or purpose for their life. Right? And if there's no plan or purpose for their life, if there's no God, that means that your morality is just as good as anybody else's morality. It doesn't really matter. Your truth is just a, a, as good as anybody else's truth. And see, that's, you know, we've, we've, we've reaped, you know, we, we sowed to the, the wind, wind, we, we reaped, reaped the whirlwind, whirlwind on this. this. And, and I, I thank God, God for godly, godly parents in this church that are teaching their children what is right. I thank, I thank God for godly parents that are bringing their children to church, bringing their children to Sunday school, bringing their kids to Awana. I thank God for our homeschool co-op here at Hales Ford Baptist Church. Amen? I thank God for that. I thank God for all... Hey, listen, I understand. There might be some parents here, and trust me, I boy, I, I grew up... Uh, you, you know, know my, my parents divorced, and, and I grew up in a home. My, my mother, you know, single mom, raising three kids. So it's not it's not easy. And so you have you have all of my sympathy. I understand it's not easy. You might say, Pastor, I've got to make a living. I can't afford the Christian school. I can't. Hey, listen. You do the best that you can to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and God will bless you if you will do everything that you can. But, but, but this, this, is, this is where we are today, this, this idea of natural selection. Well, today there is still controversy surrounding what I would call the belief in a supernatural selection. That is that God in his wisdom and providence has, has chosen who will be saved and who will be lost. And we talked about this last week, and some people will say, well, I... You know, you know, I, don't I don't understand that. that. You know, I, don't, I, don't I don't understand how anybody could, can believe that. But I'm going to tell you something. Uh, you know, there are there are different Christians that have different thoughts and views. And can I say something? That's okay. That's okay. You know, sometimes we we look at somebody and maybe they have a belief that's a little bit different from ours, and so we we want to ostracize that person because they don't believe. Exactly, exactly the way that we believe, but I'm here to tell you we need to be careful about that, and we're going to talk about this today, uh, this idea of, of election and this idea of predestination, and we're not going to finish today, by the way, and by the time we're finished uh, with it all together, we're probably not going to completely answer this thing, because as I said before, theologians have been battling this for Hundreds of years, and, and, and they still haven't figured it all out, and so I doubt that we're going to figure it all out ourselves, but I do think it's right as your pastor for us to talk about it, because if we don't, you might run into somebody who believes different than how you believe and say, well, I don't understand how you can believe that, and I think it's good for us to, to look at everything so that we can understand what we believe and why we believe it. Now... Regarding Romans chapter 9, Warren Wiersbe says that the emphasis in Romans 9 is on Israel's past election. In Romans chapter 10, the emphasis is on Israel's present rejection. And in Romans 11, the emphasis is on Israel's future restoration. Okay, so that's the thing that you need to understand. You know, first and foremost is when we come to Romans chapter 9, the importance is not uh, dealing specifically with the salvation of individual people, but, but it is dealing with the most part with the past, present, and future of Israel. And as we go through this, you're going to see that that's what Paul is talking about. And so this morning, I want to begin the message by considering what Paul says about the, the two, two Israels. Israels. The, the two Israels. Israels. If you, you have, have your Bibles there, Romans chapter 9, and let's begin in verse number 1. The Bible says, I tell the truth in Christ. Christ. I'm not lying. My, My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Look at this. That, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. heart. Why, Paul? Why do you have great sorrow and continual grief in your heart? For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ 
for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. Okay, now, here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that I would, if, if, if there was any way that my brethren, the, 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 the Israelites, the Jewish people, if, if they could all be saved, he says, says I would wish myself a curse. I, what, what he's really saying is, I would be willing to be separated from Christ and, and to go to hell if it meant that my brethren, the Jewish people, could be saved. That's what he's talking about here. Now look, look at this. My, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, look at this. To whom pertain the adoption, the, the glory, the, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. So he's talking about the Jewish people. He's talking about all of the things that have been given to the Jewish people. Look at this. Of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, look at this, Christ came. So he said, God gave all of these things. He allowed all of these things to come through the Jewish people. The glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, all of these things. And even Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah, came through the Jewish people. Look at this. Who was over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. But, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, okay? And so the, the Jewish people rejected their Messiah. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many of them as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, right? That's what the Bible says. So, so, but, but he did come into his own, and his own did not receive him. So, so does, does that mean that the word of God was of, of, of no effect? No, that's, that's not the case. But look at this. For, For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Okay, that's, that's your homework question for tonight. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. So here's what, remember, up until now we've been talking about the flesh, the flesh, the flesh, and the flesh versus the spirit. And how we should be living according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. Well, now Paul is expanding this and he's talking about the flesh and he's talking about the Jewish people. And how they, they are putting all of their eggs in the basket of their flesh. The fact that they uh, are... Uh, they, they, they come from Abraham, Abraham that they, they are the seed of, of Abraham. Abraham. You know, physically speaking, that they, they come from Abraham. And Paul is saying here, look at this, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So, so he's going, going back to Abraham and Sarah and how God made them the promise, okay, of how Isaac would come, okay? And he's saying that it's, it, the, 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 the seed is, is, it is the seed of the promise. It is, it is the children of the promise, not those who are, you know, physically, uh, you know, coming from Abraham, they, they are not, not, you know, the children of the flesh. They, they are not the ones that are being saved, but it, it is the children of the, the promise. Look at this. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even our father Isaac, look at this, for the children not yet being born, okay, remember Esau and Jacob? Okay, not being born yet, having done uh, any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. And so, by the way, so God, that's, that's strong language. Does God hate people? We're going we're gonna to look at that. Because, again, remember what I said, we're talking about nations here. We're talking about the Jewish people. And when you think about uh, when you think about Esau and Jacob, Jacob represents he's the father of the twelve tribes. He, he represents Israel um, 
when you look at Esau, he is the father of the Edomites. The Edomites were the enemies of God. And so one thing that we must understand is that the Jews are God's chosen people. In fact, if you want a really good picture of election, you know, you look at the Jewish people because God chose them. They are God's chosen people. God elected the Jews to be his special people above every other people on the earth. Listen, not because they were better, but because God had a plan to bless the rest of the world through the Jewish people. God gave them the law. He gave them his glory. He gave them the covenants. He gave them his promises. And the Messiah would ultimately come through the Jewish people. And this is what we need to understand in this area of election. Okay, when, when we talk about this, and we're going to look at this in greater depth, uh, and this is just going to be the first message because we're going to really get into this. But many people believe that election is simply about saved and lost, heaven and hell, God picking winners and losers. But what is happening here is that God is dealing with his chosen people, listen, because they are the ones who are supposed to broadcast God's glory to the nations, and instead they rejected Jesus, and again, they were counting on their Jewishness to save them. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. According to Romans 9, there are two Israels. There's the physical place that would include the Israeli people, but then there's the spiritual Israel, and those are the people who have trusted Jesus by faith. Hey, listen, whether they are Jews or or Gentiles. It doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Amen? We, we would be a part of that spiritual uh, Israel because we put our trust and faith in Christ. And we'll see that in just a little while. That's exactly what God was talking about when he made his promise to Abraham. Now understand that, again, the Jews are still God's people. God still has plans for them. And when we get to chapter 11, we'll talk more about that. But, but a person, person is not saved just because they are Jewish. A person is saved because they exercise faith in Jesus and God graciously chooses to save them. Amen? That's why a person is saved. And that's what Paul is saying here. That is why he is so sorrowful because he understands how many of his Jewish brothers and sisters are lost because they don't have Jesus Christ. Christ. Now, here's, here's the thing that we need to understand. Because you say, well, you know, I, I don't believe that, you know, I believe that God chooses people. Okay? That you don't choose God, but God, you know, chooses you. Well, here's the thing that you have to understand when it comes to this idea of salvation. There's actually two things that are going on. Okay? The first thing is that God puts out an invitation. Okay? When God puts out an invitation, God is drawing you. God is drawing people through that invitation. That's one of the reasons why we have an invitation here at Hales Ford Baptist Church. I thank God that Pastor Melvin always had an invitation. Okay? But, but the reason we have invitations is because God gives invitations in His Word. And, and so, so you might be here today, and, or, or maybe you've come in the past, and, and you're listening to the message being preached, or maybe you've been in a Sunday school class, or maybe you know somebody has talked to you in the past, and they started talking about Jesus and what Jesus did for you when he died on the cross for your sins, and, and something started to stir inside your heart. Something started to stir, and you said, I don't know what that is. I've never felt that way before. What is that feeling that is... Is there? Why am I feeling this way? And the reason that you're feeling that way is because God is stirring you. The Holy Spirit of God is stirring you. God is trying to draw you. God is putting out an invitation to you. Okay? That's what's going on. And, and you need to be careful with that because, you know, God loves you. And I said this to, to the 830 crowd, but, but can I tell you this? God wants to save you more than you want to get saved. That's how much he loves you. Did you know that? But I'll tell you this. God is under no obligation. 
You might, you might come today and you're, you're feeling that stirring in your heart and God is working and he's trying to draw you to himself. God is under no obligation to, to, to do the same thing next week or next month or, or next year. And I'll tell you this, I do believe that it is possible for a person to harden their heart and to harden their heart and say, and, and God is trying to draw them and God is trying to work with them. And they say, no, 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 I'm not going to do it. And I do believe that there can come a time where you're, you harden your heart to the place where God just will leave you alone. Leave me alone, God. Okay. If you want me to leave you alone, I'll, I'll leave you alone. But God puts out the invitation. And, and, and those who maybe feel like God just chooses everybody, part of the thinking behind that is that, you know, God almost has to regenerate you to be regenerated. God almost has to save you to get saved. And, and that's not exactly how it is, but that's kind of the thought is that you know, you're so dead. The Bible says we're dead in trespasses and sins. There's just no way that we could possibly respond. But I don't believe that. Okay? I don't believe that. And you say, well, pastor, why don't you believe that? You know, doesn't the Bible say we're dead? Yes, we're dead, but this is kind of a powerful book. Right? It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so you take this book and you combine it with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And it has the ability to affect dead people. As a matter of fact, you think about after the fall, you know, because that's kind of the idea. You know, after the fall, you know, people couldn't, you know, they were, they were so dead that they couldn't hear God speak. But, but stop and think about it. Uh, after the fall, Adam and Eve heard God speak. Cain heard God speak, Noah heard God speak, Eli, Samuel, Job, all the prophets, they had no problem hearing God speak. Does God still speak today? Sure he does. And he speaks to us through his word. And so there's an invitation where God puts out the invitation and God is, is seeking to draw you to himself. We're going to look at that scripture in, in a little bit, okay? Because that is something that is necessary is for God to draw you. Hey, listen. But it's not just the invitation. There's a second thing that has to take place, and that is a right response from you and from me. We have, to, we have to respond the right way. The sinner repents and places their faith in Jesus Christ. That is the right response, to, to agree with God about our sin and to put our faith in Jesus God must supernaturally work in your life to lead you to a place of decision. A person cannot simply say, hey, you know what, I hear what you're saying, and you know what, I even kind of believe it's true. But you know what, there's a lot of things in this life that I would really like to do, and I know God wouldn't be pleased with it. He wouldn't like it one bit. So you know what, I'm going to go out and I'm going to live my life for me and and for this world, and I'm going to do all these things that I want to do, and I know God wouldn't be pleased with it, but I'm going to do it anyway, and then when I get down to the last few moments of my life, I'm going to call on Jesus, and God has to save me. I'm going to get my cake, and I'm going to eat it too, right? That's kind of the thought. Can I tell you something? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You want to know how it works? How it works is you and I have no control whatsoever over death. You ever heard a doctor talk about somebody who had a heart attack and they, they made the comment that he or she was dead before they hit the floor? You ever heard that saying before? I've heard it before. And I believe that it, it's true. You don't have any control over how long you're going to be alive. You've got no control whatsoever. You have on in the last few moments of your life. And a lot of people who, who get to that place have hardened their hearts to God already to the place where they wouldn't even call on Him anyway. They don't even believe it anyway. And so God is going to put out the invitation because God loves you. God loves me. Remember what we said last week? Well, the Scripture, remember we said God desires, he, it says, He desires for all people to be saved. 
that is God's desire, okay, that all people would be saved. That's what the Bible says, that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. By the way, is God sovereign, yes or no? Is he? Okay, what is the, the, that means God can do anything, right? He can do anything. But wait a minute. If, if God is sovereign, if he said, I'm not willing, I'm not willing, I'm not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance, that means that God's will is for everybody to come to repentance, right? So if God is sovereign and he, he is not willing that any should perish, but his will is that everybody come to repentance, why doesn't everybody come to repentance? Right? Because we have a free will. God puts out the invitation, God draws us, but ultimately you have to make a decision as to whether you are going to receive Christ or not. This leads us to numerous questions. How does God decide who and where and when and how someone hears the gospel? How does he do that? I don't know. I was thinking about this. I see some of these kids running around here who are in the Awana program, and I think about all of the good teaching that they are getting and that they're receiving into their life. I've talked to people who've gone through the Awana program, and they talk about the fond memories and how God used that in, in their life. I think about these teenagers and what they're, they're getting in the student ministry. And, and I, don't, I don't make a big deal out of it. I don't, I don't really complain about it. But there, there have been a few times in my life where I've said to the Lord, Lord, why, did, why, 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 was it, why didn't I get saved till I was 18? Why is that how you worked in my life? Why, why was it that I couldn't have maybe gotten saved earlier? Why couldn't I have that? I would have loved to, to have that, but... I, I didn't have that. God worked in my life in a different way. And I don't know what the answer to that is. I do know that because of when I came to Christ, I think that I have the opportunity to have a certain amount of influence in people's, certain people's lives that other people maybe would not be able to have. People who maybe lived in a similar type of situation as, as what I've lived in. But, but I'm just... You know, why God? Why 18? Why not four? Why not seven? You know, why, why did it have? I don't know. And I don't know the answer for you either. But can I say something? That's why we're not God. That's why we're not God. Because I'll be honest with you, I can't keep track of it all. Right? But he can. And he knows how this person is going to get saved at this age, is going to touch this person's life over here, who's going to touch this person's life. And God knows how it's all going to work because he is sovereign. But I don't know how it's all going to work. Is it fair if one lost person hears the gospel more times than somebody else? What about people like Pharaoh in the Bible? The Bible says that God raised up Pharaoh and hardened his heart. Did God continue to harden Pharaoh's heart even after the Red Sea experience? Does God do this for all people or only in certain situations? And who are the elect? And how do I know if I am elect or not? Well, let me just say this. There's an old, I forget if it was Moody or who said it. They said there, there's kind of a, it was kind of a thing where they said, if you walk through the door and you look up and you see a sign, it says, whosoever will may come and you walk through the door and when you walk through the door you look back and there's a sign over the door it says chosen from before the foundation of the world <laughs> you know how does it work pastor i don't know well, i don't uh, you're, you're you're not a very smart pastor <laughs> you know but no i'm just i'm just simply saying that you know i don't understand it all I wish that I could understand it all, but I, I simply can't. But I will tell you this. If you, have, if you have called on the name of the Lord, the Bible says, forever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out, he says. That it, God cannot go against his own word. 
If you put your trust and faith in Christ, if there's a time in your life where you called out to the Lord that you repented of your sins and you put your trust and faith in Jesus, hey, listen, I promise you, you don't ever have to worry about one day, am I going to stand before God and have to wonder whether I am one of the elect or not, whether I belong to God or not. I promise you, you will never have to do that. Because God will not go against his word. Consider some of the difficult scripture passages. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. That's Jeremiah. Did Jeremiah have a choice after God ordained him to be a prophet to the nations? This was ordained before he was even born, right? That's what the Bible says. John 6, this is what we were talking about. No man or no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Well, when does God draw people? Where does God draw people? How does God draw people? Right? Do we understand all of that? Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him. We're going to talk about that, that phrase, in him. In him. It's important, okay? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ, to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Matthew 24, 24, For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Verse 31, And he will send his angels with a great sound, a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Many believe that that's talking about the Jewish people, that that's talking about Israel. But, but, that is not normally the case. Usually when it talks about the elect in the New Testament, it is talking about the church, okay? Romans 8, 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. John 17, 9 through 11, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have uh, given me. This is Jesus talking. Uh, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Did you know that there are those that, have, that were given to Jesus Christ? Well, if, we'll talk about this later. If you're a child of God, is it possible that you could ask God to give you people? You ever thought about that? Could God give you, God, give me the soul of that person, that neighbor of mine, that coworker. Give me the soul. God, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to look for that opportunity to share Christ with them. But God, I'm praying that you will, you'll give them to me. You'll give me, you'll, you'll, that they'll come to Christ. God, please work in their life. Hey, listen, can God do that? It's a good question. Leighton Flowers says this, I would encourage you, if, if uh, you're ever on YouTube, you want to go to Soteriology 101, Soteriology 101, it's a great, uh, time, a great place on YouTube that talks about this idea of election, predestination, but I like this, he said this, this is really good, he says election is not about God choosing some to neglect uh, other nations of the world, listen, Election is about choose, God choosing Israel here, and, and when it talks about in chapter 9, God choosing Israel to bless all the other nations of the world. That is what the promise is all about in Genesis 12. So let me read that, and we're going to close here, okay? Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. Listen, and in you all the families, not just the Jewish families, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What's he talking about? 
He's talking about you and me. Amen? That's what he's talking about. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles. And here's, how, here's what Leighton Flower said, and I like this. He said, if I, if I said to my son, son, here's a plate of cookies, and I'm electing you, I am choosing you to take these cookies, and I want you to give them to the rest of the family. Right? Now, could he resist that? Could he reject that? Could he run up in the room and start eating the cookies all by himself? He could. And then there might have to be some external pressure applied, right? I.e. Jonah. Right? But, but you've been elected, you've been chosen to take these cookies and give them out to the rest of the family. Is God trying to hurt the rest of the family? Is he trying to pick winners and losers in the family? Or is God saying, I'm electing you to go and to take my blessings to be a blessing to the rest of the family? And that's what God is doing with election. God is choosing you. God is choosing me. And he's saying, I've worked in your life. I have invited you to come. I have drawn you by the power of my Holy Spirit, and you said yes. Now take what you know and go out and do the same with other people. Amen? And that's what it's all about. We'll talk about this next time, but can I? it's interesting, you know, isn't it interesting in this whole idea of the elect, isn't it interesting that God chose to use us in his great commission. Pretty powerful thought. As, as fallible as we are, as many times as we messed up, as many times as we're afraid and we don't talk when we should, and yet God still said, I want you to be a part of me spreading the gospel around the entire world.